What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. Quick announcement before we begin. It is that time of year. It is Black Friday. So, of course, we're doing a Black Friday sale on uh, my courses. Now, not all of them because the new one, Swift UI Fundamentals, is still on sale during during the pre-sale. So that wouldn't really be right to knock it down even more, you know, and then screw over all the people that already bought it. So that price is gonna remain the same because it is already on sale. However, GitHub followers, the Take Home Project, that will be 40% off. Uh, iOS Dev Launchpad, the course for beginners, that will be 40% off. To get that discount, use the code you see here, holiday2020 at checkout at seanallen.teachable.com for whichever course you like. Okay, with that announcement out of the way, let's throw up the rundown and get into the show. First up, we have information on the Swift 5.4 release process from Nicole here on the Swift forums. And the big thing of note here is Swift 5.4 is a release focused on quality and performance enhancements. So you may not see a lot of like mainstream new language features, which isn't a bad thing at all. And the other thing to point out here is timing. Right. If you look here, uh, December 14th is when the branch will be cut uh, January 7th for some other projects here. Usually, and this is pure speculation, usually it's a couple months after this happens for the actual release. And, you know, Apple always does a, a March event. So, you know, maybe it'll line up with that. I'm just speculating, but uh, it is nice to know that Swift 5.4, you know, is on the horizon. Next up, we have subscription offer codes now available and users on iOS uh, 14 and iPadOS 14 uh, can redeem these offer codes. Now, the big thing about these offer codes here and Dennis did a, a nice write up on this, right? App Store introduces subscription offer codes. Why does it matter? And it just offers developers who have subscriptions so much more flexibility than they had previously to earn new customers or, or earn back customers that have churned away. And the big difference here, and I highly recommend checking out the article as he goes really, really in depth. I'm just gonna give the highlights here uh, because Apple used to have you know, introductory offers, promotional offers, and now offer codes. So you might be wondering like, what's the difference between these here? And you can click this Apple uh, link here. This will take you to Apple's like official documentation on all this stuff. We won't get into that, uh, but back to the article. Oh, I've gotta scroll back down. And here's the, the difference, right? The offer code, the new thing, can be used outside of the app. And as he mentions here, right, email marketing, social media, customer support, you know, if you're out at conferences. Uh, so it's just so much more flexibility that you can use this kind of in the outside world. And let's talk about some of the flexibility you have here with some of the uh, examples, right? Flexible payment options, right? You can give somebody one month free, or it's actually just a specific duration. You pick it, right? Two months free, three months free, whatever you want. And then the subscription goes. So again, Good marketing opportunities here. Another example is pay as you go. Maybe you give them a discounted price for the first three months. And then after that, it goes to the normal price. Or, you know, here's another example, pay up front, pay $10 up front for the first six months. It's kind of like the promotional period. After that first six months, you get the, the usual, you know, charge. So again, just more flexibility in how you can offer your subscriptions, offer discounts to, again, earn new customers or, you know, win back old customers. Next, I'm sure you've already heard this. I've already done a video about this, so I'll keep this one quick, uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't not include it in Swift News, but Apple announces the App Store Small Business Program. Essentially, Apple's cutting their commission from 30% to 15% if you earn uh, under a million dollars per year, and that is after Apple takes their cut. So there's a little buffer. You can earn a little more than 1 million. Uh, some key things here uh, is it does say, uh, commission on paid apps and in-app purchases. Now in my video, I questioned this. I even questioned it on Twitter saying like, well, I don't see subscriptions, you know, so are those included? And then a lot of people chimed in and said, you know, subscriptions are technically in-app purchases. So they're saying that yes, because it says in-app purchases, subscriptions are also 15% and not 30. I can easily see that being correct, right? I'm not here arguing that. However, <laughs> I can also see because they didn't mention subscriptions, I can also see them saying that no subscriptions aren't included because there's there's already a path to 15% on subscriptions, right? The first year is 30%, after that is 15%. Now, I'm actually leaning towards that it is part of in-app purchases, it is included, you know, based on what everybody's been telling me. That's what I think is going to happen. I just wanna point out that it would not surprise me one bit <laughs> if they weren't included. So let's not assume that just yet. And on that note here, if we scroll down, uh, comprehensive details will be released in early December. So there's been a lot of speculation on how exactly this is going to work, but it's just that it's speculation. 
hopefully these comprehensive details in early December will answer all of our questions. But overall, of course, people complain about anything on Twitter. You know, Apple couldn't have done this. We could still be stuck with the 30%. And what are we going to do? Go to another platform? Like, yeah, antitrust, monopoly. I get it, but that's just how it is right now. So the fact that they're doing something and hopefully this is like the first step of, of a few things to improve the app store and bring it into like modern times, because all these app store rules were established in like 2010 when the app store came out or 2009, whatever year it was, doesn't matter. But, you know, the world has changed and the whole, you know, business of software development has changed. So I think it's time for the app store to, to evolve, you know, with those changes. But anyway, I'm excited to see these comprehensive details in early December uh, and that can kind of like stop all the speculation and we can know for sure how this is going to work. But overall, good news. Next up, we have SF Symbols 2.1 is out. By the way, Mike Stern, if you're not following him, uh, you know, platform experience, design evangelist manager at Apple, definitely give him a follow, puts out a lot of good stuff like so. Uh, but anyway, SF Symbols 2.1 is out. Uh, seems like a small update, uh, over 40 new symbols, improved uh, localization, design refinements, various software fixes. I haven't been able to find uh, what these 40 new symbols are. Like there's no like, or at least I haven't found any like release notes or anything like that. But if you click on uh, the link here in the tweet, you can see the download for SF Symbols 2.1 is right here. So if you wanna stay up to date on your SF Symbols, there you go. Next up, I wanna talk about Big Sur Mac icons here. And we have a website from Elias here. If you wanna support, feel free. But uh, what I like about this is being able to just scroll through, as you see this number here, 2100 plus, Big Sur icons, uh, mainly just for inspiration, right? These are actually existing like companies, but you know, it's just nice to scroll through real quick and see what other companies are doing with their Big Sur uh, icons. We're obviously in the, the Adobe world right now, but uh, again, scroll through these real quick, uh, check out some icons, get some inspiration. If you are looking to, you know, bring your Mac app icon into the, uh, the Big Sur era, if you will, to, with this kind of squircle look. I don't know. What do you think about the Squircle look, by the way? Some people don't like uh, it because you're kind of losing all the, the very unique uh, app icons that we used to get on the Mac. Now everything is within this, this Squircle, if you will. So I don't know. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. But anyway, scroll this, get some inspiration, see all the cool stuff other people are doing with their uh, app icon. Moving on, let's talk about Swift UI previews from Antoine Vanderlee here. And I have a love-hate relationship with previews now that I've been working in SwiftUI a lot. Um, sometimes you gotta write a lot of code just for your previews. And uh, you know, as programmers, right, the more code you write, that means the more you gotta maintain, the more opportunity for bugs, the more confusing your views can be if your preview code is like 300 lines long. So you know, there's, there's a balance here, but I like what Antoine's talking about on uh, certain views how you can create your previews to really speed up your workflow. And he uses a simple share button, as you can see here, right? Just a very simple button that he's built in the uh, WeTransfer app. But let's talk about how he uh, utilizes the previews to speed up the development for this specific view, right? Well, first you can change the, the size uh, of your preview, right? Use a custom size for Swift UI preview. Because if we scroll back up, a giant phone. Imagine if you ha had, you know, four previews here, you'd have to scroll down a bit just to see them all, just for this little button. So you wanna create custom size for these, these previews, right? Cool, you can see that there. And then you show multiple previews in Xcode, as you can see. So now you can have, you know, five or six of them lined up pretty quickly for this, again, for this specific view. It's not gonna work for all views. Um, you can show dark mode. Uh, you can also show, there's dark mode, different locales, right? If you're dealing with localization, right? He's got a Dutch button and an English button. And then obviously the uh, dynamic type sizes as well. Right, so you can see here's what it is, extra small, large, extra large. So for certain views like this, it is nice to be able to see all the, the light mode, dark mode, accessibility, all in like, you know, five or six or seven. I only say that for how many can probably fit vertically on a screen, uh, previews. So anyway, I like Antoine's article about customizing these previews in that way uh, for certain views. And I know I need to step up my preview game because uh, <laughs> this is bad. I usually end up just like not using previews at all because I don't want to deal with it. Um, I feel like that's a bad habit and I feel like I need to fix that. Uh, so this article kind of pointed me in the right direction. Next up, we have an article from Mark Opon of Lickability and his Lickability team here, I assume. Never mind child labor laws, it's cool. <laughs> but Swift on Raspberry Pi Workshop Part 3. So there's a Part 1 and a Part 2. Now, 
I don't really have much to contribute to this because I don't really know anything about Raspberry Pis. I've never worked with them, but I know many of you out there probably have and probably do. I know they're very popular. Uh, well, Mark has done a whole series. Again, there's part one, part two, uh, about using Swift to work uh, on your Raspberry Pi. And in this particular article, they're gonna add a speaker to create a noise. Uh, but again, there's you know two parts uh, prior to this. So. Like I said, I just wanted to share it. Uh, I know Mark, Mark's a cool guy. Uh, and I know a lot of you are probably interested in Raspberry Pis. So here's how you can use Swift on your Raspberry Pi. Wanted to share that. And finally, AR Corner here. If you're interested in AR, definitely give Oscar here uh, a follow. You see he's an AR technology evangelist at Apple. I've also met him in person, cool guy. Uh, but you know he posts a lot of cool AR stuff. And again, this is the whole acid trip that is AR. Again, when you have glasses, this one's really cool how it's actually like detecting your hand and moving things. And what I think when I see this is like, now imagine if you had like a haptic suit on, right? And as you're moving it, you're feeling the haptics, especially with the new PlayStation 5 controller. I haven't, I don't have a PlayStation 5, but all I've heard about is how the haptics in the controller are like super awesome next gen. So you can imagine something like that combined with AR. Uh, now you can start to see the possibilities. I, we're still probably five to 10 years away from that, but you can start to see the possibilities here. This marble thing's pretty cool, right? So the marble is like detecting its environment around it, or the, I guess the phone is, um, and then it's actually going down the slide as you would expect, you know, based on the physics. Thought that was pretty cool. And then again, this is another acid trip one, right? You can like paint the sky with, sure, <laughs> I don't know. Again, AR can just be a giant acid trip, who knows? But that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode of Swift News. Again, the Black Friday sale, seanallen.teachable.com. Check that out and we'll see you in the next episode.